Book Talk begins at 5 minutes and 53 seconds. Welcome to Craftlit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 638, Color Your Classics. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by Laura Peacemaker. What an awesome name. Rebecca S., Gail Clewer, Lou Dunham, and Lindsay Kemplin. Thank you so much. I couldn't do this without you. All right. So I have to give you three chapters today. And the third one is long, but it's a box set. I can't separate them in good faith because it would just be lame and we'd lose the momentum. And so I apologize in advance. It's going to be a long one, but it's a good one. That said, I'm postponing talking about the next day, I think it's day four, on the Craftlet tour to Denmark and Sweden. But next week, I will pick it up and we will talk then. It'll be far less pressureful. And honestly, I'm having a massive allergy attack right now. My neck is unbelievably itchy. And it doesn't matter what I do, what I take, what I put on it, nothing is working. So I'm kind of distracted. I hate that. Christmas stories. Christmas stories. There is a Google form that's in the show notes. It's actually the same Google form that I used years ago, 2015, to start collecting Christmas stories again. And I realized not only should you share if you have Christmas stories that you have read in the past and you liked, Gift of the Magi, for example, which is always a winner, but also if you have written any Christmas stories. And additionally, would you be interested in recording with me about why you like the story that you are submitting as much as you do? That's going to be added to the form for you to fill out whether yes or no you'd like to be interviewed or not. And yeah, thanks. I think that would be fun, 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 fun. Along with that, don't forget, we have the bookmark exchange. The day that this comes out is going to be the last day to sign up for the bookmark exchange for this holiday season. Again, there is a Google form link in the show notes, craftlet.com slash 638. And yeah, it's we've been doing it for a while now, and it has not waned in beauty or awesomeness <laughs> in either respect. I've Everything that I've seen anybody receive, if they pop up on the Tuesday or Thursday Zoom call, it's always just lovely. And certainly the bookmarks that I've received have been gorgeous. So thank you. And let's do it again, shall we? Last thing before we dive into the book, Eric has made us the cutest little coloring book pages, well, coloring pages, one of them, you can have a version that is colored in already. So you could just check things off. The other one is a black and white line art page of bookshelves full of books that we've done on Craftlet. And so for those of you who have been listening for a while, it might be kind of fun for you to download one or the other of these or both, why not, and color in the books that you've listened to with us. It's a lot. I I mean, it's been 17 years, Heather, duh. But it's a sizable list of books on the shelf. And I don't even think the premium books are listed on there. So that was really cool. Thank you, Eric. And I hope you have as much fun with it as I am having right now. All righty. Anne Blanton wrote in with the definition of a felucca. Boy, Now I know why I couldn't find it. I was spelling it so wrong. A small vessel propelled by oars or lateen sails or both used on the Nile and formerly more widely in the Mediterranean region in general. So wood, about 10 people 
with a crew of two or three. So not huge, but, you know, worth getting on if you have access. I also, while I was looking up all sorts of crazy things for today, I found a website that was written by, as far as I can tell, a film crew that was doing their own version of, it may have been with the university. It's really hard. They didn't, it's hard to tell they didn't put any information like an about page or anything because it was just internal, but it is on the web and I found it. And they did some really nice information gathering on the locations that are discussed in the book. So if you've been curious to see some of these places, look no further. There is a link in the show notes for 638 that will take you to this this guy's page. And it's really kind of cool. Let's see, where did we end off last week? Last week, at the very end, Athos and Porthos and Aramis had heard the Cardinal's conversation with Milady. Athos knew that he had to beat it out of there or risk being seen by Milady, which would have been bad. So we left off with him sneaking away, and D'Artagnan is still off with his troops, his lower level troops. So he's still fighting. So that's where everybody is at the beginning of today's chapters. And Today's chapters, all three of them, have some lovely verbal slapstick. There's a lot of Porthos comedy. And today, Porthos is both being clever at the beginning and then kind of being used in a Abbott and Costello kind of way towards the end of the third chapter. But it's still a lot of fun. There are also a couple of things that Dumas does that I'm going to bring up after we've listened a couple of things that he does in these three chapters that are really, really smart writing. He puts a lot of these actions into Athos's hands, which makes perfect sense. But you know how sometimes you see movies, especially thrillers or that kind of adventure-y, mystery-y stories. And while you're watching it, you're like, oh, that's great. That's awesome. That's wonderful. And then afterwards, you're like, yeah, you know what? Wait, because if I were actually there at the time, I would never have done that because that was stupid. The other people would know these things. There are at least two really good examples of not sloppy writing in today's chapters. So that's kind of fun. Don't forget that while we are listening to this book, it was written in a different time period, 1844, and it's being written about an even earlier time period, 1625. And so when somebody's talking about having the mark of Cain on them, we know that that has been used over and over, over the years as all sorts of horrible things. Some of them racist, some of them, you know, just blah. The important thing here is to remember that for Dumas, writing about the earlier time, one of the things that just like we look back and go, oh, everybody was so much more superstitious back then. And, you know, they believed in all this kooky stuff, humors and whatever. Regardless of what Dumas himself thought, he is writing about people who, for them, somebody having the mark of Cain on them would be serious. That's like not something you can walk back. But evil is your nature. The end. And so claiming that someone has the mark of Cain is both no joke coming from the character, but also a signal to us as the readers, like this person is not redeemable. Depending on which version you are listening to, you may notice there is a letter written by Richelieu. It comes up three times in the course of the book, and you can tell that they were written during different weeks because the date keeps changing. So just in case, some translators have chosen to just pick a day that makes sense in history, and that's fine. Some translators have chosen not to touch it with a 10-foot pole, and they've left it the way it is. So that is something to know. A letter of Mark, M-A-R-Q-U-E. This is an actual historical thing. It was a way for someone in a position of power to explain in writing that the ship in question is armed and it could be used to capture enemy fleet or other modes of transportation on the ocean. 
So things that would otherwise have been categorized as piracy, if you have a letter of mark, you get a pass on that. There's a use of the word peculiar, which makes perfect sense in context at the time, but the way it rolls off in this particular translation comes across kind of strangely. Porthos gives his mustache a twist which was peculiar to him. It wasn't that he was peculiar in the way that he twisted his mustache. It was that it was his twist. It was his trademark twist, just so you know, because otherwise that comes across kind of strangely. Also, in our second chapter today, we have some comedy, amity, amity with soldiers from other places. This is not something that we have seen dealt with ever that I can remember. Remind me if I am wrong, 206-350-1642 or heather at craftlet.com. But I'm pretty sure this is going to be the first time we have seen an author other than Mark Twain writing dialects phonetically to gently poke fun at other characters from other places. So we have dragoons. Dragoons were mounted soldiers. We have a Swiss soldier. And he is definitely being poked fun at. I am sure that there are some very specific historical reasons why the Swiss is taking the brunt of the teasing in this section, but I am not going to be able to track that down. If you know anything about the particular history between France and Switzerland, please let me know. And it is decidedly Swiss in the text, but I know that the borders of countries were still mobile, flexible, fungible at the time. So if this is a joke that you know has to do with some of those issues, also please let us know. 206-350-1642 or heather at craftlet.com. You will hear D'Artagnan referring to the angles of a building. He's talking about the corner of a building, like where the, the cornerstone would be. That's all. There's a, a reference to wrapping the viands in a napkin. Viands, V-I-A-N-D-S, is an assortment of foods, kind of a smorgasbord of food. It's being tied up into a napkin, a white napkin. It's definitely white. It is used later as a flag. Just understand that in this case, at this time with these people, a white flag does not mean surrender. The way that nowadays we'd say, you know, wave a white flag, let them know you are surrendering, don't shoot. That is not what's going on here, just so you know. There is a Latin phrase that Aramis says, and it starts with like anti-disestablishmentarianism, which is almost true. It looks almost that long is what I mean animad vertuntur, which is an old phrase that means being noticed, but it's kind of in a hunted way, that there is some amount of like attracting attention or drawing somebody's focus. It can also be used about thinking, like you're being drawn towards thinking about something you've noticed. And this phrase, I have looked for it high and low. I dragged out the OED. I cannot find the reference, although I am fairly certain it is biblical because the second half of the quote is in desertis. So it's easy to notice people in the desert. And this is in response to D'Artagnan saying we could go down to the beach and the beach, while it is not a desert, it is a big, broad, flat place where it would be easy to be seen. I am absolutely positive that there is a secondary level to this. I just could not find it for you. So I apologize for that. You'll also hear shortly after that the word ball being referred to. What they're talking about is a bullet. We shall indubitably attract a ball. We will draw fire from somebody who's shooting bullets. And then in our last chapter, the biggest chapter, there's a phrase pepper caster, which I was pretty sure was pepper shaker, but it's also, it was translated in one of the modern texts as just straight up gun turret. 
And that's not entirely correct. I thought that was kind of odd. It's more like if you think of the sword fight on the cliff with Princess Bride, how there are stone walls that were crumbling down, kind of one of the straighter pieces that you could stand behind while people were shooting at you. That would be what we're talking about here, something that looks a little bit like a tall pepper shaker. Also, loopholes, L-O-O-P-H-O-L-E-S, which I know we've come across before, those were the arrow slits that were built into stone walls in fortresses and fortifications, and they were things you could shoot through or go through. So a means of escape, as well as a, a way to fire on your enemies without being put into danger yourself overly much which is why we still use loophole the way we do. Like, oh, well, that's a loophole in the contract. That's an escape area. A mistake was made in the contract giving you an out. The interesting thing was in one of the translations, he calls them murder holes, which is a lot closer to the original French. So the French word at the time for loophole, the military loophole, was apparently a reference to the fact that it was easier to kill people through these holes in the wall. And so they were referred to that way as a kind of a diminutive, which I thought was super interesting. Don't forget that when our three main musketeers, well, four, because by this time they will be back together with D'Artagnan, when they are talking about firing on civilians, remember that they're talking about Protestants. It is a, a setup for a joke later, and that joke actually has an awful lot to do thematically with what's going on in today's chapters. So just kind of keep that in the back of your head. There's also a reference to an order called the Magdalens or the Repentant Daughters, the Madelinettes or the Daughters of Repentance. They were, I think it was 1640 that they were started. It was allegedly a place where you could help prostitutes, rehabilitate them. But the way that they were being rehabilitated was by forcibly being placed into a convent and they had to stay there. So good. Mm, I'm not so sure. I mean, was it better than being out on the street and being endangered? Absolutely. But not so much the free will thing. And the word pleurisy. Pleurisy here is being used in a very general way. It's basically there's no reason for us to hurry and cause ourselves a heart attack. And that's that's all it means. So you are going to hear a password given by Richelieu. And I had to call in my heavy hitter, Alix, to help me with this because the password in some of the translations is King and Ray, R E with an accent mark, or Wa et Ray, which means nothing if you look at Google Translate because Ray just translates as the letter D. And then Alice said, well, you know, do, re, mi, fa, so, le, ti, do, it's going to be in there. But then, because Alice is so fabulous. Alex remembered that the previous chapter <laughs> during the Siege of La Rochelle, uh, they talked about the Isle of Ray. So it's king and that particular part of the country, that's the password. So now you know. When you hear it, you won't be nearly as confused as I was. So there was another... Uh, word that I had to engage Alex on for support, uh, parpaio. So in some of the translations, the musketeers are going to meet up at the inn of the heretic. Some of them are going to meet up at the uh, parpaio or the inn of the parpaio. And the footnotes that I had in my books were all indicating that Parpoyo was uh, an insult or an insulting way to refer to Protestants. And Alix found some really interesting 
breakdowns of of the word that yes it is supposed to be derogatory but nobody really said how it's derogatory and one of the ways that it can be translated is that it's a a kind of a slang term for a butterfly and the implication is inconsistent like a butterfly like flitting around from flower to flower which i think actually does make kind of poetic sense that if you're Catholic at the time and you're looking at these Protestants, these Calvinists, these heretics, as far as you're concerned, um, they're not stable enough to just stick with the Pope, right? They're off reading doctrine this and text that and theses those, and that's kind of an inconsistent position if you are speaking from the position of somebody who has been part of the Holy Roman Church for well over a thousand years, 1500 years, I think you would feel pretty stable and refer to anybody very reasonably who wasn't in that stability category as kind of being flighty. So another big thank you to Alix. All right, there is a a curse word, (laughs) or not a curse word, it's not, it doesn't come in that heavily at all, but it's clearly something that they had trouble translating. And it may have been trouble because uh, the same way that Dumas had been uh, making fun of the dragoons and the Swiss soldier and people speaking in phonetics, the swear word was written in a phonetic way to imply how this one character with a not French accent was was saying it. You will hear the word balsam bleu. That's uh, B-A-L-Z-E-M-P-L-E-U. And Alex found... Palsam bleu, P-A-L-S-A-M-B-L-E-U, which fits with some of the other uh, dialectical jokes that Dumas is making. And it's it's just another way of saying uh, God's blood or by the blood of God or bleu in this case replaces God and And just in case you're interested in seeing more, Alex also sent me a link, and the the title of the page just made my day. It is 18 Ancient Swear Words to Use Every Day! (laughs) Exclamation point. And that is where Palsam Bleu shows up. So, again, huge thanks. That link is going to be in the show notes for you. All right. We are going to listen now to chapters 45, 46, and 47 of The Three Musketeers. If you are listening to a different version, you can jump back in here at 1 hour, 23 minutes, and 44 seconds. All right, here we go. Chapter 45 of The D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A CONJUGAL SCENE As Athos had foreseen, it was not long before the cardinal came down. He opened the door of the room in which the musketeers were and found Porthos playing an earnest game of dice with Aramis. He cast a rapid glance around the room and perceived that one of his men was missing. "'What has become of Monseigneur Athos?' asked he. "'Monseigneur,' replied Porthos, "'has gone as a scout.' on account of some words of our host, which made him believe the road was not safe. "'And you, what have you done, Monsieur Porthos?' "'I have won five pistoles of Aramis.' "'Well, now will you return with me?' "'We are at your eminence's orders.' "'To horse, then, gentlemen, for it is getting late.' The attendant was at the door, holding the cardinal's horse by the bridle, At a short distance, a group of two men and three horses appeared in the shade. These were the two men who were to conduct Milady to Fort Lapointe, 
and superintend her embarkation. The attendant confirmed to the cardinal what the two musketeers had already said with respect to Athos. The cardinal made an approving gesture and retracted his route with the same precautions he had used in coming. Let us leave him to follow the road to the camp protected by his esquire and the two musketeers and return to Athos. For a hundred paces he maintained the speed at which he started, but when out of sight he turned his horse to the right, made a circuit, and came back within twenty paces of a high hedge to watch the passage of the little troop. Having recognized the lace hats of his companions and the golden fringe of the cardinal's cloak, he waited till the horsemen had turned the angle of the road and having lost sight of them, he returned at a gallop to the inn, which was open to him without hesitation. The host recognized him. "'My officer,' said Athos, "'has forgotten to give a piece of very important information to the lady, and has sent me back to prepare his forgetfulness.' "'Go up,' said the host. "'She is still in the chamber.' Athos availed himself of the permission, ascended the stairs with his lightest step, gained the landing and through the open door perceived milady putting on her hat he entered the chamber and closed the door behind him at the noise he made in pushing the bolt milady turned round athos was standing before the door enveloped in his cloak with his hat pulled down over his eyes on seeing this figure mute and immovable as a statue milady was frightened who are you and what do you want cried she Humph murmured Athos. It is certainly she. And letting fall his cloak and raising his hat, he advanced toward Milady. Do you know me, madame? said he. Milady made one step forward, then drew back as if she had seen a serpent. So far, well, said Athos, I perceive you know me. The Comte de la Fere murmured Milady, becoming exceedingly pale and drawing back till the wall prevented her from going any farther. "'Yes, Milady,' replied Athos, "'the Comte de la Fere in person, who comes expressly from the other world, to have the pleasure of paying you a visit. Sit down, madame, and let us talk, as the cardinal said.' Milady, under the influence of inexpressible terror, sat down without uttering a word. "'You certainly are a demon sent upon the earth,' said Athos. "'Your power is great, I know, but you also know that with the help of God men have often conquered the most terrible demons. You have once before thrown yourself in my path. I thought I had crushed you, madame, but either I was deceived or hell has resuscitated you.' Milady, at these words, which recalled frightful remembrances, hung down her head with a suppressed groan. "'Yes, hell has resuscitated you,' continued Athos. "'Hell has made you rich. Hell has given you another name. Hell has almost made you another face. But it has neither effaced the stains from your soul nor the brand from your body.' Milady arose as if moved by a powerful spring, and her eyes flashed lightning. Athos remained sitting. "'You believed me to be dead, did you not, as I believed you to be, and the name of Athos as well concealed the Comte de la Fere as the name Milady Cleric concealed Anne de Broye. Was it not so you were called when you honored brother married us? Our position is truly a strange one,' continued Athos, laughing. "'We have only lived up to the present time.' because we believed each other dead, and because a remembrance is less oppressive than a living creature, though a remembrance is sometimes devouring. But, said Milady in a hollow, faint voice, what brings you back to me? And what do you want with me? I wish to tell you that though remaining invisible to your eyes, I have not lost sight of you. You know what I have done. I can relate to you day by day your actions from your entrance to the service of the cardinal to this evening. A smile of incredulity passed over the pale lips of Milady. Listen. It was you who cut off the two diamond studs from the shoulder of the Duke of Buckingham. It was you who had the Madame Bonacieux carried off. 
It was you who, in love with De Ward and thinking to pass the night with him, opened the door to Monsieur d'Artagnan. It was you who, believing that De Ward had deceived you, wished to have him killed by his rival. It was you, when this rival had discovered your infamous secret, wished to have him killed in his turn by two assassins whom you sent in pursuit of him. It was you, finding the balls had missed their mark, sent poisoned wine with a forged letter, to make your victim believe that the wine came from his friends. In short, it was you, who have but now in this chamber, seated in this chair I now fill, made an engagement with Cardinal Richelieu, to cause the Duke of Buckingham to be assassinated, in exchange for the promise he has made you, to allow you to assassinate D'Artagnan. Milady was livid. "'You must be Satan!' cried she. "'Perhaps,' said Athos, "'but at all events listen well to this. "'Assassinate the Duke of Buckingham "'or cause him to be assassinated. "'I care very little about that. "'I don't know him. "'Besides, he is an Englishman. "'But do not touch with the tip of your finger "'a single hair of D'Artagnan, "'who is a faithful friend whom I love and defend.' or I swear to you by the head of my father, the crime which you shall have endeavored to commit, or shall have committed, shall be the last. Monsieur d'Artagnan has cruelly insulted me, said Milady in a hollow tone. Monsieur d'Artagnan shall die. Indeed, is it possible to insult you, madame? said Athos, laughing. He has insulted you. "'And he shall die?' "'He shall die,' replied Milady. "'She first, and he afterwards.' Athos was seized with a kind of vertigo. The sight of this creature, who had nothing of the woman about her, recalled awful remembrances. He thought how one day, in a less dangerous situation than the one in which he was now placed, he had already endeavored to sacrifice her to his honor. His desire for blood returned, burning his brain and pervading his frame like a raging fever. He arose in his turn, reached his hand to his belt, drew forth a pistol and cocked it. Milady, pale as a corpse, endeavored to cry out, but her swollen tongue could utter no more than a hoarse sound which had nothing human in it and resembled the rattle of a wild beast. Motionless against the dark tapestry, with her hair in disorder, she appeared like a horrid image of terror. Athos slowly raised his pistol, stretched out his arm so that the weapon almost touched Milady's forehead, and then in a voice the more terrible from having the supreme calmness of a fixed resolution. Madame, said he, you will this instant deliver to me the paper the cardinal signed, or upon my soul. I will blow your brains out. With another man, Milady might have preserved some doubt, but she knew Athos. Nevertheless, she remained motionless. You have one second to decide, said he. Milady saw by the contraction of his countenance that the trigger was about to be pulled. She reached her hand quickly to her bosom, drew out a paper, and held it toward Athos. Take it! said she, and be accursed. Athos took the paper, returned the pistol to his belt, approached the lamp to be assured that it was the paper, unfolded it and read, December 3rd, 1627. It is by my order and for the good of the state that the bearer of this has done what he has done. Richelieu. And now, said Athos, resuming his cloak and putting on his hat, now that I have drawn your teeth, viper, Bite, if you can. And he left the chamber without once looking behind him. At the door he found the two men and the spare horse which they held. Gentlemen, said he, Monseigneur's order is, you know, to conduct that woman without losing time to Fort La Pointe, and never to leave her till she is on board. As these words agreed wholly with the order they had received, they bowed their heads in sign of assent. With regard to Athos, he leapt lightly into the saddle and set out at full gallop. Only instead of following the road, he went across the fields, urging his horse to the utmost and stopping occasionally to listen. In one of those halts he heard the steps of several horses on the road. He had no doubt it was the cardinal and his escort. He immediately made a new point in advance, rubbed his horse down with some heath and leaves of trees, 
and placed himself across the road about two hundred paces from the camp. "'Who goes there?' cried he as soon as he perceived the horseman. "'That is our brave musketeer, I think,' said the cardinal. "'Yes, Monseigneur,' said Porthos. "'It is he.' "'Monsieur Athos,' said Richelieu, "'receive my thanks for the good guard you have kept. "'Gentlemen, we are arrived. "'Take the gate on the left. "'The watchword is King and Ray." Saying these words, the cardinal saluted the three friends with an inclination of his head, and took the right hand, followed by his attendant, for that night he himself slept in the camp. "'Well,' said Porthos and Aramis together as soon as the cardinal was out of hearing, "'well, he signed the paper she required.' "'I know it,' said Athos coolly, "'since here it is.' and the three friends did not exchange another word till they reached their quarters, except to give the watchword to the sentinels. Only they sent Mousqueton to tell Planchet that his master was requested, the instant that he left the trenches, to come to the quarters of the musketeers. Milady, as Athos had foreseen on finding the two men that awaited her, made no difficulty in following them. She had had for an instant an inclination to be reconducted to the cardinal and relate everything to him but a revelation on her part would bring about a revelation on the part of Athos. She might say that Athos had hanged her, but then Athos would tell that she was branded. She thought it was best to preserve silence, to discreetly set off to accomplish her difficult mission with her usual skill, and then, all things being accomplished to the satisfaction of the cardinal, to come to him and claim her vengeance. In consequence, after having traveled all night, at seven o'clock she was at the fort of the point, at eight o'clock she had embarked, and at nine the vessel, which with the letters of Mark from the cardinal was supposed to be sailing for Bayonne, raised anchor and steered its course toward England. End of chapter 45 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 46 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE BASTION ST. GERVAIS On arriving at the lodging of his three friends, D'Artagnan found them assembled in the same chamber. Athos was meditating, Porthos was twisting his mustache, Aramis was saying his prayers in a charming little book of hours, bound in blue velvet. "'Pardieu, gentlemen,' said he, "'I hope what you have to tell me is worth the trouble, or else I warn you.' I will not pardon you for making me come here instead of getting a little rest after a night spent in taking and dismantling a bastion. Ah, why were you not there, gentlemen? It was warm work. We were in a place where it was not very cold, replied Porthos, giving his mustache a twist, which was peculiar to him. Hush, said Athos. Oh, said D'Artagnan comprehending the slight frown of the musketeer. "'It appears there is something fresh aboard.' "'Aramis,' said Athos, "'you went to breakfast the day before yesterday at the inn of the Parpaillot, I believe?' "'Yes.' "'How did you fare?' "'For my part, I ate but little. The day before yesterday was a fish day, and they had nothing but meat.' "'What?' said Athos. "'No fish at a seaport.' "'They say,' said Aramis, resuming his pious reading, "'that the dike which the cardinal is making "'drives them all out into the open sea.' "'But that is not quite what I mean to ask you, Aramis,' replied Athos. "'I want to know if you were left alone and nobody interrupted you.' "'Why, I think there were not many intruders.' "'Yes, Athos, I know what you mean. "'We shall do very well at the Parpaillot.' "'Let us go to the Parpaillot, then, "'for here the walls are like sheets of paper.' "'D'Artagnan, who was accustomed to his friend's manner of acting, "'and who perceived immediately by a word, a gesture, or a sign from him "'that the circumstances were serious, "'took Athos's arm and went out without saying anything. "'Porthos followed, chatting with Aramis.' On their way they met Grimaud. Athos made him a sign to come with them. Grimaud, according to custom, obeyed in silence. The poor lad had nearly come to the pass of forgetting how to speak. 
they arrived at the drinking room of the Parpaillot. It was seven o'clock in the morning, and daylight began to appear. The three friends ordered breakfast and went into a room in which the host said they would not be disturbed. Unfortunately, the hour was badly chosen for a private conference. The morning drum had just been beaten. Everyone shook off the drowsiness of the night, and to dispel the humid morning air, came to take a drop at the inn. Dragoons, Swiss, guardsmen, musketeers, light horsemen succeeded one another with a rapidity which might answer the purpose of the host very well, but agreed badly with the views of the four friends. Thus they applied very curtly to the salutations, healths, and jokes of their companions. "'I see how it will be,' said Athos. "'We shall get into some pretty quarrel or other, and we have no need of one just now. D'Artagnan, tell us what sort of a night you have had, and we will describe ours afterwards.' "'Ah, yes!' said a light horseman with a glass of brandy in his hand, which he sipped slowly. "'I hear you, gentlemen of the guards, have been in the trenches tonight, and that you did not get much the best of the Rochelais.' D'Artagnan looked at Athos to know if he ought to reply to this intruder, who thus mixed unasked in their conversation. "'Well,' said Athos, "'don't you hear, Monsieur de Busigny, who does you the honor to ask you a question? Relate what has passed during the night, since these gentlemen desire to know it.' "'Have you not taken a bastion?' said a Swiss, who was drinking rum out of a beer-glass. "'Yes, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan, bowing. "'We have had that honor. We even have, as you may have heard, introduced a barrel of powder under one of the angles, which in blowing up made a very pretty breach, without reckoning that as the bastion was not built yesterday, all the rest of the building was badly shaken.' "'And what bastion is it?' asked the dragoon with his saber run through a goose which he was taking to be cooked. "'With a bastion St. Gervais,' replied D'Artagnan, "'from behind which the Rochelais annoyed our workmen.' "'Was that a fair hot?' "'Yes, moderately so. We lost five men, and the Rochelais eight or ten. "'Bells and bleu!' said the Swiss, who, notwithstanding the admirable collection of oaths possessed by the German language, had acquired a habit of swearing in French. "'But it is probable,' said the light horseman, "'that they will send pioneers this morning to repair the bastion.' "'Yes, that's probable,' said D'Artagnan. "'Gentlemen,' said Athos, "'a wager.' "'Ah, oui, a wager!' cried the Swiss. "'What is it?' said the light horseman. "'Stop a bit!' said the dragoon, placing his saber like a spit upon the two large iron dogs, which held the firebrands in the chimney. "'Stop a bit! I am in it! You cursed host! A dripping pan immediately, that I may not lose a drop of the fat of this estimable bird!' "'You was right,' said the Swiss. "'Goose grease is cooed with pastry!' "'There,' said the dragoon. "'Now, for the wager, we listen, Monsieur Athos!' "'Yes, the wager!' said the light horseman. "'Well, Monsieur de Busigny, I will bet you,' said Athos, "'that my three companions, Messieurs Porthos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan, and myself, "'will go and breakfast in the bastion St. Gervais, "'and we will remain there an hour by the watch, "'whatever the enemy may do to dislodge us.' Porthos and Aramis looked at each other. They began to comprehend. "'But!' said d'artagnan in the ear of athos you are going to get us all killed without mercy we are much more likely to be killed said athos if we do not go my faith gentlemen said porthos turning round upon his chair and twisting his mustache that's a fair bet i hope i take it said monsieur de busigny so let us fix the stake you are four gentlemen said Athos, and we are four, an unlimited dinner for eight. Will that do? Capitally, replied Monsieur de Busigny. Perfectly, said the dragoon. That shoots me, said the Swiss. The fourth auditor, who during all this conversation had played a mute part, made a sign of the head in proof that he acquiesced in the proposition. The breakfast for these gentlemen is ready, said the host. 
"'Well, bring it,' said Athos. The host obeyed. Athos called Grimaud, pointing to a large basket which lay in a corner, and made a sign to him to wrap the viands up in the napkins. Grimaud understood that it was to be a breakfast on the grass, took the basket, packed up the viands, added the bottles, and then took the basket on his arm. "'But where are you going to eat my breakfast?' asked the host. "'What matter if you are paid for it?' said Athos, and he threw two pistoles majestically on the table. "'Shall I give you the change, my officer?' said the host. "'No, only add two bottles of champagne, and the difference will be for the napkins.' The host had not quite so good a bargain as he had at first hoped for, but he made amends by slipping in two bottles of Anjou wine instead of two bottles of champagne. "'Monsieur de Busigny, said Athos, "'will you be so kind as to set your watch with mine, or permit me to regulate mine by yours?' "'Which you please, monsieur,' said the light horseman, drawing from his fob a very handsome watch, studded with diamonds. "'Half past seven. Thirty-five minutes after seven, said Athos, "'by which you perceive I am five minutes faster than you.' and bowing to all the astonished persons present, the young men took the road to the Bastion St. Gervais, followed by Grimaud, who carried the basket ignorant of where he was going, but in the passive obedience which Athos had taught him not even thinking of asking. As long as they were within the circle of the camp, the four friends did not exchange one word. Besides, they were followed by the curious, who, hearing of the wager, were anxious to know how they would come out of it. But when once they passed the line of circumvallation and found themselves in the open plain, D'Artagnan, who was completely ignorant of what was going forward, thought it was time to demand an explanation. "'And now, my dear Athos,' said he, "'do me the kindness to tell me where are we going?' "'Why, you see plainly enough, we are going to the bastion.' "'But what are we going to do there?' "'You know well that we go to breakfast there.' "'But why did we not breakfast at the Parpeillot? "'Because we have very important matters to communicate to one another, "'and it was impossible to talk five minutes in that inn "'without being annoyed by all those importunate fellows "'who keep coming in, saluting you, and addressing you. "'Here, at least,' said Athos, pointing to the bastion, "'they will not come and disturb us.' "'It appears to me,' said D'Artagnan, with that prudence which allied itself in him so naturally with excessive bravery, "'that we could have found some retired place on the downs or the seashore, where we should have been seen all four conferring together, so that at the end of a quarter of an hour the cardinal would have been informed by his spies that we were holding a council.' "'Yes,' said Aramis, "'Athos is right.' Animad vertentur in desertis. A desert would not have been amiss, said Porthos, but it behooved us to find it. There is no desert where a bird cannot pass over one's head, where a fish cannot leap over the water, where a rabbit cannot come out of its burrow, and I believe that bird, fish, and rabbit each becomes a spy of the cardinal. Better then, pursue our enterprise from which, besides, we cannot retreat without shame. We have made a wager, a wager which could not have been foreseen, and of which I defy any one to divine the true cause. We are going in order to win it, to remain an hour in the bastion. Either we shall be attacked or not. If we are not, we shall have all the time to talk, and nobody will hear us, for I guarantee the walls of the bastion have no ears. If we are, we will talk of our affairs just the same. Moreover, in defending ourselves, we shall cover ourselves with glory." You see that everything is to our advantage. Yes, said D'Artagnan, but we shall indubitably attract a ball. Well, my dear, replied Athos, you know well that the balls most to be dreaded are not from the enemy. But for such an expedition, we surely ought to have brought our muskets. You are stupid, friend Porthos. Why should we load ourselves with a useless burden? I don't find a good musket, twelve cartridges, and a powder flask very useless in the face of an enemy. Well, replied Athos, have you not heard what D'Artagnan said? 
"'What did he say?' demanded Porthos. "'D'Artagnan said that in the attack of last night eight or ten Frenchmen were killed, and as many Rochelais.' "'What then?' "'The bodies were not plundered, were they? It appears the conquerors had something else to do.' "'Well?' "'Well, we shall find their muskets, their cartridges, and their flasks, and instead of four musketoons and twelve balls, we shall have fifteen guns and a hundred charges to fire.' "'Oh, Athos!' said Aramis. "'Truly you are a great man!' Porthos nodded in sign of agreement. D'Artagnan alone did not seem convinced. Grimaud, no doubt, shared the misgivings of the young man, foreseeing that they continued to advance toward the bastion. Something he had till then doubted. He pulled his master by the skirt of his coat. "'Where are we going?' asked he by a gesture. Athos pointed to the bastion. "'But,' said Grimaud in the same silent dialect, "'we shall leave our skins there.' Athos raised his eyes and his finger toward heaven. Grimaud put his basket on the ground and sat down with a shake of the head. Athos took a pistol from his belt, looked to see if it was properly primed, cocked it, and placed the muzzle close to Grimaud's ear. Grimaud was on his legs again as if by a spring. Athos then made him a sign to take up his basket and to walk on first. Grimaud obeyed. All that Grimaud gained by this momentary pantomime was to pass from the rear guard to the vanguard. Arrived at the bastion, the four friends turned around. More than three hundred soldiers of all kind were assembled at the gate of the camp, and in a separate group might be distinguished Monsieur de Busigny, the dragoon, the Swiss, and the fourth better. Athos took off his hat, placed it on the end of his sword, and waved it in the air. All the spectators returned him his salute, accompanying this courtesy with a loud hurrah, which was audible to the four. After which, all four disappeared in the bastion, whither Grimald had preceded them. End of chapter 46 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 47 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1 The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas Translated by William Robson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Council of the Musketeers as Athos had foreseen, the bastion was only occupied by a dozen corpses, French and Rochelais. Gentlemen, said Athos, who had assumed the command of the expedition, while Grimaud spreads the table, let us begin by collecting the guns and cartridges together. We can talk while performing that necessary task. These gentlemen, added he, pointing to the bodies, cannot hear us. But we could throw them into the ditch, said Porthos. After having assured ourselves, they have nothing in their pockets. Yes, said Athos, that's Grimaud's business. Well, then, cried D'Artagnan, pray let Grimaud search them and throw them over the walls. Heaven forfend, said Athos, they may serve us. These bodies serve us, said Porthos. You are mad, dear friend. "'Judge not rashly, say the gospel and the cardinal,' replied Athos. "'How many guns, gentlemen?' Twelve, replied Aramis. "'How many shots?' "'A hundred. "'That's quite as many as we shall want. Let us load the guns.' The four musketeers went to work, and as they were loading the last musket, Grimaud announced that the breakfast was ready. Athos replied, always by gestures, that that was well, and indicated to Grimaud by pointing to a turret that resembled a pepper-caster, that he was to stand as sentinel. Only, to alleviate the tediousness of the duty, Athos allowed him to take a loaf, two cutlets, and a bottle of wine. "'And now to table,' said Athos. The four friends seated themselves on the ground with their legs crossed like Turks, or even tailors. "'And now,' said D'Artagnan, "'as there is no longer any fear of being overheard,' I hope you are going to let me into your secret. I hope at the same time to procure you amusement and glory, gentlemen, said Athos. I have induced you to take a charming promenade. Here is a delicious breakfast, and yonder are five hundred persons, as you may see through the loopholes, taking us for heroes or madmen, two classes of imbeciles greatly resembling each other. But the secret, said D'Artagnan. The secret is 
said Athos, that I saw Milady last night. D'Artagnan was lifting a glass to his lips, but at the name of Milady, his hand trembled so that he was obliged to put the glass on the ground again for fear of spilling the contents. You saw with... Hush! interrupted Athos. You forget, my dear, you forget that these gentlemen are not initiated into my family affairs like yourself. I have seen Milady. Where? demanded D'Artagnan. Within two leagues of this place, at the inn of the Red Dovecot. In that case I am lost, said D'Artagnan. Not so bad yet, replied Athos, for by this time she must have quit the shores of France. D'Artagnan breathed again. "'But after all,' asked Porthos, "'who is Milady?' "'A charming woman,' said Athos, sipping a glass of sparkling wine. "'Villainous host,' cried he, "'he has given us Anjou wine instead of champagne, and fancies we know no better.' "'Yes,' continued he, "'a charming woman who entertained kind views toward our friend D'Artagnan,' who on his part has given her some offense for which she tried to revenge herself a month ago by having him killed by two musket shots, a week ago by trying to poison him, and yesterday by demanding his head of the cardinal. "'What? By demanding my head of the cardinal?' cried D'Artagnan, pale with terror. "'Yes, that is true as the gospel,' said Porthos. "'I heard her with my own ears.' "'I also.' said Aramis. Then, said D'Artagnan, letting his arm fall with discouragement, it is useless to struggle longer. I may as well blow my brains out, and all will be over. That's the last folly to be committed, said Athos, seeing it is the only one for which there is no remedy. But I can never escape, said D'Artagnan, with such enemies. First my stranger of Meung, then de Ward, to whom I have given three sword wounds, next Milady, whose secret I have discovered, finally the cardinal, whose vengeance I have balked. Well, said Athos, that only makes four, and we are four, one for one. Pardieu, if we may believe the signs Grimaud is making, we are about to have to do with a very different number of people. What is it, Grimaud? Considering the gravity of the occasion, I permit you to speak, my friend. But be laconic, I beg. What do you see? A troop. Of how many persons? Twenty men. What sort of men? Sixteen pioneers. Four soldiers. How far distant? Five hundred paces. Good. We have just time to finish this fowl, and to drink one glass of wine to your health, D'Artagnan. To your health, repeated Porthos and Aramis. Well, then, uh, to my health although I am very much afraid that your good wishes will not be of great service to me. Bah! said Athos. God is great, as say the followers of Mohammed, and the future is in his hands. Then, swallowing the contents of his glass, which he put down close to him, Athos arose carelessly, took the musket next to him, and drew near to one of the loopholes. Porthos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan followed his example— as to Grimaud, he received orders to place himself behind the four friends in order to reload their weapons. Pardieu, said Athos, it was hardly worth while to distribute ourselves for twenty fellows armed with pickaxes, mattocks, and shovels. Grimaud had only to make them a sign to go away, and I am convinced they would have left us in peace. I doubt that, replied D'Artagnan, for they are advancing very resolutely. Besides, in addition to the pioneers, there are four soldiers and a brigadier armed with muskets. That's because they don't see us, said Athos. My faith, said Aramis, I must confess I feel a great repugnance to fire on these poor devils of civilians. He is a bad priest, said Porthos, who has pity for heretics. In truth, said Athos, Aramis is right, I will warn them. "'What the devil are you going to do?' cried D'Artagnan. "'You will be shot!' But Athos heeded not his advice. Mounting on the breach with his musket in one hand and his hat in the other, he said, bowing courteously and addressing the soldiers and the pioneers, who, astonished at this apparition, stopped fifty paces from the bastion. 
Gentlemen, a few friends and myself are about to breakfast in this bastion. Now, you know nothing is more disagreeable than being disturbed when one is at breakfast. We request you, then, if you really have business here, to wait till we have finished our repast, or to come again a short time hence, unless, which would be far better, you form the salutary resolution to quit the side of the rebels and come and drink with us to the health of the King of France. "'Take care, Athos!' cried D'Artagnan. "'Don't you see they are aiming?' "'Yes, yes,' said Athos. "'But they are only civilians, very bad marksmen, who will not be sure to hit me.' In fact, at the same instant four shots were fired, and the balls were flattened against the wall around Athos, but not one touched him. Four shots replied to them almost instantaneously, but much better aimed than those of the aggressors. Three soldiers fell dead, and one of the pioneers was wounded. Grimaud, said Athos, still on the breach, another musket. Grimaud immediately obeyed. On their part, the three friends had reloaded their arms. A second discharge followed the first. The brigadier and two pioneers fell dead. The rest of the troop took to flight. Now, gentlemen, a sortie, cried Athos, and the four friends rushed out of the fort, gained the field of battle, picked up the four muskets of the privates and the half-pike of the brigadier, and convinced that the fugitives would not stop till they reached the city, turned again toward the bastion, bearing with them the trophies of their victory. "'Reload the muskets, Grimaud,' said Athos. "'And we, gentlemen, will go on with our breakfast and resume our conversation. Where were we?' "'I recollect you were saying,' said D'Artagnan, "'that after having demanded my head of the cardinal,' Milady had quit the shores of France. Whither goes she? Added he, strongly interested in the route Milady followed. She goes into England, said Athos. With what view? With the view of assassinating, or causing to be assassinated, the Duke of Buckingham. D'Artagnan uttered an exclamation of surprise and indignation. But this is infamous, cried he. As to that said Athos. I beg you to believe that I care very little about it. Now you have done, Grimaud. Take our brigadier's half-pike, tie a napkin to it, and plant it on top of our bastion, that these rebels of Rochelet may see that they have to deal with a brave and loyal soldiers of the king. Grimaud obeyed without replying. An instant afterward the white flag was floating over the heads of the four friends. A thunder of applause saluted its appearance, Half the camp was at the barrier. How? replied D'Artagnan. You care little if she kills Buckingham or causes him to be killed. But the Duke is our friend. The Duke is English. The Duke fights against us. Let her do what she likes with the Duke. I care no more about him than an empty bottle. And Athos threw, fifteen paces from him, an empty bottle from which he had poured the last drop into his glass. A moment said D'Artagnan. I will not abandon Buckingham thus. He gave us some very fine horses. And moreover, very handsome saddles, said Porthos, who at the moment wore on his cloak the lace of his own. Besides, said Aramis, God desires the conversion, and not the death of the sinner. Amen, said Athos, and we will return to that subject later, if such be your pleasure. But what for the moment engaged my attention most earnestly, and I am sure you will understand me, D'Artagnan, was the getting from this woman a kind of carte blanche, which she had extorted from the cardinal, and by means of which she with impunity could get rid of you and perhaps us. "'But this creature must be a demon,' said Porthos, holding out his plate to Aramis, who was cutting up a fowl. "'And this carte blanche,' said D'Artagnan, this carte blanche, does it remain in her hands? No, it passed into mine. I will not say without trouble, for if I did, I should tell a lie. My dear Athos, I shall no longer count the number of times I am indebted to you for my life. Then it was to go to her that you left us, said Aramis. Exactly. And you have that letter of the cardinal. Here it is said Athos, and he took the invaluable paper from the pocket of his uniform. D'Artagnan unfolded it with one hand, whose trembling he did not even attempt to conceal to read. 
December 3rd, 1627. It is by my order and for the good of the state that the bearer of this has done what he has done. Richelieu. In fact, said Aramis, it is an absolution according to the rule. That paper must be torn to pieces, said D'Artagnan, who fancied he read in it his sentence of death. On the contrary, said Athos, it must be preserved carefully. I would not give up this paper if covered with as many gold pieces. And what will she do now? asked the young man. Why, replied Athos carelessly, she is probably going to write to the cardinal that a damned musketeer named Athos has taken her safe conduct from her by force. She will advise him in the same letter to get rid of his two friends, Aramis and Porthos, at the same time. The cardinal will remember that these are the same men who have often crossed his path, and then some fine morning he will arrest D'Artagnan, and for fear he should feel lonely, he will send us to keep him company in the Bastille. "'Go to! It appears to me you make dull jokes, my dear,' said Porthos. "'I do not jest,' said Athos. "'Do you know,' said Porthos, that to twist that damned milady's neck would be a smaller sin than to twist those of these poor devils of Huguenots, who have committed no other crime than singing in French the psalms we sing in Latin. What says the abbe? asked Athos quietly. I say I am entirely of Porthos's opinion, replied Aramis. And I too, said D'Artagnan. Fortunately she is far off said Porthos, for I confess she would worry me if she were here. She worries me in England as well as in France, said Athos. She worries me everywhere, said D'Artagnan. But when you held her in your power, why did you not drown her, strangle her, hang her, said Porthos? It is only the dead who do not return. You think so, Porthos? replied the musketeer with a sad smile, which D'Artagnan alone understood. "'I have an idea,' said D'Artagnan. "'What is it?' said the musketeers. "'To arms!' cried Grimaud. The young men sprang up and seized their muskets. This time a small troop advanced, consisting of from twenty to twenty-five men, but they were not pioneers, they were soldiers of the garrison. "'Shall we return to the camp?' said Porthos. I don't think the sides are equal. Impossible for three reasons, replied Athos. The first, that we have not finished breakfast. The second, that we still have some very important things to say. And the third, that it yet wants ten minutes before the lapse of the hour. Well then, said Aramis, we must form a plan of battle. That's very simple, replied Athos. As soon as the enemy are within musket shot, we must fire upon them. If they continue to advance, we must fire again. We must fire as long as we have loaded guns. If those who remain of the troop persist in coming to the assault, we will allow the besiegers to get as far as the ditch, and then we will push them down upon their heads that strip of wall which keeps its perpendicular by a miracle. Bravo! cried Porthos. Decidedly, Athos, you were born to be a general, and the cardinal who fancies himself a great soldier is nothing beside you. Gentlemen, said Athos, no divided attention, I beg. Let each one pick out his man. I cover mine, said D'Artagnan. And I mine, said Porthos. And I mine, said Aramis. Fire, then, said Athos. The four muskets made but one report, but four men fell. The drum immediately beat, and the little troop advanced at charging pace. Then the shots were repeated without regularity, but always aimed with the same accuracy. Nevertheless, as if they had been aware of the numerical weakness of the friends, the Rochelais continued to advance in quick time. With every three shots at least two men fell, but the march of those who remained was not slackened. Arrived at the foot of the bastion, there were still more than a dozen of the enemy. A last discharge welcomed them, but did not stop them. They jumped into the ditch and prepared to scale the breach. "'Now, my friends,' said Athos, "'finish them at a blow. To the wall! To the wall!' 
and the four friends, seconded by Grimaud, pushed with the barrels of their muskets an enormous sheet of the wall, which bent as if pushed by the wind and detaching itself from its base, fell with a horrible crash into the ditch. Then a fearful crash was heard, a cloud of dust mounted toward the sky, and all was over. "'Can we have destroyed them all, from the first to the last?' said Athos. "'My faith, it appears so,' said D'Artagnan. "'No!' cried Porthos. "'There go three or four limping away.' In fact, three or four of these unfortunate men, covered with dirt and blood, fled along the hollow way, and at length regained the city. These were all who were left of the little troop. Athos looked at his watch. "'Gentlemen,' said he, "'we have been here an hour, and our wager is won, but we will be fair players. Besides, D'Artagnan has not told us his idea yet.' And the musketeer, with his usual coolness, reseated himself before the remains of the breakfast. "'My idea,' said D'Artagnan. "'Yes, you said you had an idea,' said Athos. "'Oh, I remember,' said D'Artagnan. "'Well, I will go to England a second time. I will go and find Buckingham.' "'You shall not do that, D'Artagnan,' said Athos coolly. "'And why not? Have I not been there once?' Yes, but at that period we were not at war. At that period Buckingham was an ally and not an enemy. What would you now do amounts to treason? D'Artagnan perceived the force of this reasoning and was silent. But, said Porthos, I think I have an idea in my turn. Silence, for Monsieur Porthos, idea, said Aramis. I will ask leave of absence of Monsieur de Treville, on some pretext or other which you must invent. I am not very clever at pretexts. Milady does not know me. I will get access to her without her suspecting me, and when I catch my beauty, I will strangle her. Well, replied Athos, I am not far from approving the idea of Monsieur Porthos. For shame, said Aramis, kill a woman. No, listen to me. I have the true idea. Let us see your idea, Aramis, said Athos, who felt much deference for the young musketeer. We must inform the queen. Ah, my faith, yes, said Porthos and D'Artagnan at the same time. We are coming nearer to it now. Inform the queen, said Athos. And how? Have we relations with the court? Could we send anyone to Paris without its being known in the camp? From here to Paris it is a hundred and forty leagues. Before our letter was at Angers, we should be in a dungeon. As to remitting a letter with safety to Her Majesty, said Aramis, coloring, I will take that upon myself. I know a clever person at Tours. Aramis stopped on seeing Athos smile. "'Well, do you not adopt this means, Athos?' said D'Artagnan. "'I do not reject it altogether,' said Athos. "'But I wish to remind Aramis that he cannot quit the camp, "'and that nobody but one of ourselves is trustworthy, "'that two hours after the messenger has set out, "'all the capuchins, all the police, all the black caps of the cardinal "'will know your letter by heart, "'and you and your clever person will be arrested.' "'Without reckoning?' objected Porthos, that the queen would save Monsieur de Buckingham, but would take no heed of us. Gentlemen, said D'Artagnan, what Porthos says is full of sense. Aha! But what's going on in the city yonder? said Athos. They are beating the general alarm. The four friends listened. The sound of the drum plainly reached them. "'You see, they are going to send a whole regiment against us,' said Athos. "'You don't think of holding out against a whole regiment, do you?' said Porthos. "'Why not?' said the musketeer. "'I feel myself quite in a humor for it, and I would hold out before an army if we had taken the precaution to bring a dozen more bottles of wine.' "'Upon my word, the drum draws near,' said D'Artagnan. "'Let it come,' said Athos. It is a quarter of an hour's journey from here to the city, 
consequently a quarter of an hour's journey from the city to hither. That is more than enough time for us to devise a plan. If we go from this place, we shall never find another so suitable. Ah, stop! I have it, gentlemen. The right idea has just occurred to me. Tell us. Allow me to give Grimaud some indispensable orders. Athos made a sign for his lackey to approach. Grimaud, said Athos, pointing to the bodies which lay under the wall of the bastion. Take those gentlemen, set them up against the wall, put their hats upon their heads and their guns in their hands. Oh, the great man, cried D'Artagnan. I comprehend now. You comprehend, said Porthos. And do you comprehend, Grimaud, said Aramis. Grimaud made a sign in the affirmative. That's all that is necessary, said Athos. Now for my idea. I should like, however, to comprehend, said Porthos. That is useless. Yes, yes, Athos's idea, cried Aramis and D'Artagnan at the same time. This milady, this woman, this creature, this demon, has a brother-in-law, as I think you told me, D'Artagnan. Yes, I know him very well, and I also believe that he has not a very warm affection for his sister-in-law. There is no harm in that. If he detested her, it would be all the better, replied Athos. In that case, we are as well off as we wish. And yet, said Porthos, I would like to know what Grimaud is about. Silence, Porthos, said Aramis. What is her brother-in-law's name? Lord de Winter. Where is he now? He returned to London at the first sound of war. Well, there's just the man we want, said Athos. It is he whom we must warn. We will have him informed that his sister-in-law is on the point of having someone assassinated, and beg him not to lose sight of her. There is in London, I hope, some establishment like that of the Magdalens or of the Repentant Daughters. He must place his sister in one of these, and we shall be in peace. Yes, said D'Artagnan, till she comes out. Ah, my faith, said Athos. You require too much, D'Artagnan. I have given you all I have, and I beg leave to tell you that this is the bottom of my sack. But I think it would be still better, said Aramis, to inform the Queen and Lord de Winter at the same time. Yes, but who is to carry the letter to Tours, and who to London? I will answer for Bazin, said Aramis. And I for Planchet, said D'Artagnan. I, said Porthos, if we cannot leave the camp, our lackeys may. To be sure they may, and this very day we will write the letters, said Aramis. Give the lackeys money, and they will start. We will give them money, replied Athos. Have you any money? The four friends looked at one another, and a cloud came over the brows which but lately had been so cheerful. Look out, cried D'Artagnan. I see black points and red points moving yonder. What did you talk of a regiment, Athos? It is a veritable army. My faith, yes, said Athos. There they are. See the sneaks come without drum or trumpet. Ha! Have you finished, Grimaud? Grimaud made a sign in the affirmative and pointed to a dozen bodies which he had set up in the most picturesque attitudes. Some carried arms, others seemed to be taking aim, and the remainder appeared merely to be sword in hand. Bravo, said Athos. That does honor to your imagination. Ah, very well, said Porthos. But I should like to understand. Let us decamp first and you will understand afterward. A moment, gentlemen, a moment. Give Grimaud time to clear away the breakfast. Ah, ah, said Aramis. The black points and the red points are visibly enlarging. I am of D'Artagnan's opinion. We have no time to lose in regaining our camp. My faith, said Athos, I have nothing to say against a retreat. We bet upon one hour, and we have stayed an hour and a half. Nothing can be said. Let us be off, gentlemen. Let us be off. Grimaud was already ahead with the basket and the dessert. 
The four friends followed ten paces behind. "'What the devil shall we do now, gentlemen?' cried Athos. "'Have you forgotten anything?' said Aramis. "'The white flag! Morbleu! We must not leave a flag in the hands of the enemy, even if that flag be but a napkin!' And Athos ran back to the bastion, mounted the platform, and bore off the flag. But as the Rochelais had arrived within musket range, they opened a terrible fire upon this man, who appeared to expose himself for pleasure's sake. But Athos might be said to bear a charmed life. The balls passed and whistled all around him, and not one struck him. Athos waved his flag, turning his back on the guards of the city and saluting those of the camp. On both sides loud cries arose, on one side cries of anger, on the other cries of enthusiasm. A second discharge followed the first, and three balls, by passing through it, made the napkin really a flag. Cries were heard from the camp, "'Come down! Come down!' Athos came down. His friends, who anxiously awaited him, saw him return with joy. "'Come along! Athos, come along!' cried D'Artagnan. "'Now we have found everything except money. It would be stupid to be killed.' But Athos continued to march majestically, whatever remarks his companions made, and they, finding their remarks useless, regulated their pace by his. Grimaud and his basket were far in advance, out of the range of the balls. At the end of an instant they heard a furious fusillade. "'What's that?' asked Porthos. "'What are they firing at now? I hear no balls whistle, and I see nobody.' "'They are firing at the corpses,' replied Athos. "'But the dead cannot return their fire.' "'Certainly not. They will then fancy it is an ambuscade. They will deliberate, and by the time they have found out the pleasantry, we shall be out of the range of their balls. That renders it useless to get a pleurisy by too much haste.' "'Oh, I comprehend now,' said the astonished Porthos. "'That's lucky,' said Athos, shrugging his shoulders. "'On their part,' The French, on seeing the four friends return at such a step, uttered cries of enthusiasm. At length a fresh discharge was heard, and this time the balls came rattling among the stones around the four friends, and whistling sharply in their ears. The Rochelais had at last taken possession of the bastion. "'These Rochelais are bungling fellows,' said Athos. "'How many have we killed of them, a dozen? "'Or fifteen. "'How many did we crush under the wall?' eight or ten? And in exchange for all that, not even a scratch? Ah, but what is the matter with your hand, D'Artagnan? It bleeds seemingly. Oh, it's nothing, said D'Artagnan. A spent ball? Not even that. What is it, then? We have said that Athos loved D'Artagnan like a child, and this somber and inflexible personage felt the anxiety of a parent for the young man. Only grazed a little, replied d'artagnan my fingers were caught between two stones that of the wall and that of my ring and the skin was broken that comes of wearing diamonds my master said athos disdainfully ah to be sure cried porthos there is a diamond why the devil then do we plague ourselves about money when there is a diamond stop a bit said aramis well thought of, Porthos. This time you have an idea. Undoubtedly, said Porthos, drawing himself up at Athos's compliment. As there is a diamond, let us sell it. But, said D'Artagnan, it is the Queen's diamond. The stronger reason why it should be sold, replied Athos. The Queen saving Monsieur de Buckingham, her lover, nothing more just. The queen saving us, her friends, nothing more moral. Let us sell the diamond. What says Monsieur the Abbe? I don't ask Porthos, his opinion has been given. Why, I think, said Aramis, blushing as usual, that his ring not coming from a mistress, and consequently not being a love token, D'Artagnan may sell it. My dear Aramis, you speak like theology personified. Your advice, then, is? To sell the diamond, replied Aramis. Well, then, said D'Artagnan gaily, 
Let us sell the diamond and say no more about it. The fusillade continued, but the four friends were out of reach, and the Rochelet only fired to appease their consciences. My faith, it was time that idea came into Porthos's head. Here we are at the camp. Therefore, gentlemen, not a word more of this affair. We are observed. They are coming to meet us. We shall be carried in triumph. In fact, as we have said, the whole camp was in motion. More than two thousand persons had assisted, as at a spectacle, in this fortunate but wild undertaking of the four friends, an undertaking of which they were far from suspecting the real motive. Nothing was heard but cries of, Live the musketeers! Live the guards! Monsieur de Busigny was the first to come and shake Athos by the hand, and acknowledge that the wager was lost. The dragoon and the Swiss followed him, and all their comrades followed the dragoon and the Swiss. There was nothing but felicitations, pressures of the hand, and embraces. There was no end to the inextinguishable laughter at the Rochelet. The tumult at length became so great that the cardinal fancied there must be some riot, and sent La Houdinière, his captain of the guards, to inquire what was going on. The affair was described to the messenger with all the effervescence of enthusiasm. "'Well?' asked the cardinal on seeing La Houdinière return. "'Well, monseigneur,' replied the latter, three musketeers and a guardsman laid a wager with Monsieur de Busigny that they would go and breakfast in the bastion St. Gervais, and while breakfasting they held it for two hours against the enemy, and have killed I don't know how many Rochelais.' "'Did you inquire the names of those three musketeers?' "'Yes, monseigneur.' "'What are their names?' "'Messieurs Athos, Porthos, and Aramis.' "'Still my three brave fellows,' murmured the cardinal, and the guardsman. "'D'Artagnan!' "'Still my young scapegrace. "'Positively, these four men must be on my side.' The same evening the cardinal spoke to M. de Treville of the exploit of the morning, which was the talk of the whole camp. M. de Treville, who had received the account of the adventure from the mouths of the heroes of it, related it in all its details to his eminence, not forgetting the episode of the napkin. "'That's well, M. de Treville,' said the cardinal. "'Pray let that napkin be sent to me. I will have three fleur-de-lis embroidered on it in gold, and will give it to your company as a standard.' "'Monseigneur,' said Monsieur de Treville, "'that will be unjust to the guardsmen. Monsieur d'Artagnan is not with me. He serves under Monsieur de Sart. "'Well, then take him,' said the cardinal. "'When four men are so much attached to one another, it is only fair that they should serve in the same company.' That same evening Monsieur de Treville announced this good news to the three musketeers and d'Artagnan, inviting all four to breakfast with him next morning. D'Artagnan was beside himself with joy. We know that the dream of his life had been to become a musketeer. The three friends were likewise greatly delighted. "'My faith,' said D'Artagnan to Athos, "'you had a triumphant idea. As you said, we have acquired glory and were enabled to carry on a conversation of the highest importance.' "'Which we can resume now without anybody suspecting us, for, with the help of God,' We shall henceforth pass for cardinalists. That evening D'Artagnan went to present his respects to Monsieur de Sassar and inform him of his promotion. Monsieur de Sassar, who esteemed D'Artagnan, made him offers of help, as this change would entail expenses for equipment. D'Artagnan refused, but thinking the opportunity a good one, he begged him to have the diamond he put into his hand valued, as he wished to turn it into money. The next day, M. de Sassart's valet came to D'Artagnan's lodging and gave him a bag containing seven thousand livres. This was the price of the Queen's diamond. End of chapter 47 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Okay, so, D'Artagnan is a musketeer, for realsies. And he's seven thousand livres richer, which is... Not nothing. I wonder how long he will have that much money with him, <laughs> with friends like these. Who knows? But yeah, you didn't know that was coming, did you? I mean, we all knew it was coming eventually, but we're not at the end of the book yet. So yeah, 
he's not going to get the blue tabard or anything like that quite quite yet because of course he is still fighting it's a little hard to just go and get a new set of clothes when you are in a war but one of the things i wanted to let you know i didn't say it beforehand the, the first chapter we listened to today where it's the the scene between athos and milady is called a conjugal scene which i just found utterly hilarious because we think of conjugal visits as being positive things here not so much yes they were married not so great a thing for either of them now did you catch that athos's name is the comte de fer and do you remember where you heard that name before all right back at the beginning the very very beginning of the book dumas made the joke and i pointed it out at the time that he went to the manuscript to get access to a folio. It was number 4772 or 4773. We don't really remember which. And it had the title, The Memoirs of the Comte de Fer, Touching Some Events Which Passed in France Towards the End of the Reign of King Louis XIII and the Commencement of the Reign of King Louis XIV. This was the fake document that Dumas said he was taking his own fake story from and where he got the names Athos, Porthos, and Aramis from. So he doesn't make a big deal about it. It's just if you're paying attention at the beginning, now you know. Athos is actually the person who in this fictionalized meta part of the story is responsible for telling this story. I also thought it was pretty interesting that Athos says, I can relate to you day by day your actions from the entrance to the service of the Cardinal to this evening, which is like, wow. Okay. So that means number one, everybody has a great memory. And number two, that means she must have just started working for the Cardinal, right? Like she arrived and got this gig right at the same time that D'Artagnan came into Paris. So that I did not get at all my first couple times through. I I thought that she'd been doing this for a while and D'Artagnan was the only newbie, but nope. It is also, I think, worth noting that Milady wants the same kind of justice as the guys. She has been wronged by D'Artagnan. She wants retribution. She wants to be able to kill D'Artagnan. And in her, it's a bad thing. And in our guys, it is, of course, heroic and just. And Dumas, I am pretty sure, saw that imbalance because while she has done some pretty reprehensible things so far, it's going to get worse. The other thing that is, I think, important about this is that if Dumas had not had Milady as our really superb evil doer in the story. The only other quote unquote bad guy that he'd be able to write about is Richelieu. And there are things Milady's going to do and has already done that Richelieu could never have done, even if he was a woman, because Richelieu is a real guy and had his real lifetime. And we're leaning on the fact that the king, the queen, Duke of Buckingham, Richelieu, they're all real people, and Dumas can only futz with reality so much. So there would never have been a way that he could have written this book with Richelieu as the main bad baddie. I also thought it was very interesting that Milady doesn't just say during that scene that she's going to kill D'Artagnan. She says she first and he afterward. And the she that she's talking about, I'm pretty sure, isn't Kitty. I'm pretty sure it is Constance. So the first piece of really good problem-solving writing that I wanted to point out was when Milady runs, when she leaves the inn and she's on her way with her little guard escort to get on a boat to go to England, She's going through her mind saying, well, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I should go talk to the cardinal. But she thinks it through and realizes, well, no, she, she might be able to say, Athos is horrible. He tried to hang me. 
But then Athos would quite definitely tell Richelieu that she was branded with the fleur de lis. And a fleur de lis on a flag is just fine, but as a brand, not so much. Her thinking was better to just go do my job, do a good job, come back, get the reward, get the glory, get my vengeance. The second really good problem solving moment of writing, I thought, was in our second chapter today, where Athos chose going to the Bastion, which was nuts, as we saw. I mean, for one thing, Athos just standing there going, civilians aren't very good shots. They're not going to hit me. And they didn't hit him. And when the soldiers showed up, yes, they were better shots. and Yes, they were perfectly capable of killing our musketeers. But the, the whole idea of the walls have ears, but actually everywhere has ears because if we are seen talking, especially with D'Artagnan there, having been pulled off the front, that would be kind of a giveaway. And then Richelieu's job would be to find out what it was that they were talking about. And he will. We know this man is capable of finding out pretty much anything he wants. There's also, I think, a a super important thing that is happening in this third chapter, uh, kind of in the middle, when Aramis and Porthos have their back and forth about how maybe it's not so great to fire on civilians. By the time Dumas wrote this book, the French landscape was not as Catholic as it had been, capital C, like ruled by Catholicism. And as a consequence, there were, it's kind of like if I were going to write a story set in 1840 in the United States, and I was going to set it in the South, the way that I would telegraph to you that the character was a good person would be that that's the one person who never uses the N-word. That's the one person who is not a slave owner, who is kind to uh, everybody, poor, red, white, black, anything. That would be me using our modern ethics to give we modern readers a cue about somebody back in the day. Whether that would have been true or not, it is me in my modern setting trying to use cultural shorthand to understand these these older characters. Dumas is doing exactly the same thing here with Aramis and, and Porthos, that these guys are good guys. And then the follow-up to that is when Porthos said, it, it seems to me it would be better to twist that damn milady's neck. That would be a smaller sin than to twist those of these poor devils of Huguenots who've committed no other crime than singing in French the Psalms we sing in Latin. That is not nothing. And it's interesting, I thought, that he put it into Porthos's mouth since Porthos had been kind of the the comedic relief for much of these three chapters. I also thought it was pretty interesting that Dumas specifically has Athos several times in these three chapters being very respectful of Muslims. He's not saying Mohammedan, which, as we talked about before, is not true. That was a way to not aggressively insult, but to still insult Muslims, because, of course, it's not like you believe in Muhammad. It's Allah which is what Atho says. There is only one God. There were a couple of jokes that got lost in translation, I thought, when D'Artagnan says, well, it's useless to struggle any longer then. I may as well blow my brains out and all will be over. The modern translation says, Athos responds to D'Artagnan, yeah, let's save that mistake for the end, shall we? It's like, let's not get ahead of ourselves. That's not going to do anybody any good. Just stop. And then the the other one that I thought didn't get translated particularly well for the humor in the original Victorian translation was Porthos saying the first time around, because it was a running gag, I would like to understand what we're doing, what we're being told by Athos to do. In the more modern version, the way it's translated, the upshot is, yeah, that would not really do us any good. Moving on. And just kind of blowing him off like, it's it's useless. It's not going to help any if you understand. Just do it. So Porthos, he's all over the place. 
just in case you got confused, by the way, the idea that the the guys came up with was, yes, they have to warn Buckingham against Milady, but since they're officially at war with England, they decide to warn Lord de Winter and warn him that he's about to be killed by his sister-in-law, Milady, and that he should protect himself and Buckingham. And then their next goal is to find Constance, Madame Bonacieux, before Milady and the Cardinal get a chance to. That protection letter, that carte blanche, that it's like a blanket pardon letter, the one that has the wrong date on it every or a different date on it every time, he still has that, which is useful. And then because it goes by so quickly, just a reminder, Planchet goes to London to get word to de Winter, and Bazin is going to Aramis's countess, which is where Kitty is, and that's how they're going to get word to the queen. All right. I think that's everything. Different chapters. The vibe of these chapters was so different, but part, I think part of that is because we're outside of Paris now and, and in a very different arena for our guys to be running around in. So, so there it is. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great week. Don't forget, sign up for the bookmark exchange. If you haven't already, let me know about Christmas stories. If you have any that you would like to either share that you have written, or if you have any that you would like to share because you've read them and thought they were awesome. And that's it. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Mm-hmm.